One of my favorite verses in the Bible is uh, John 10.10. 10. I have quoted it many times since I've been here. Uh, but it is, uh, Jesus said that a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come, he said, to give life. To give life in all of its abundance. Uh, we must not think that that abundance is uh, riches, although it may be for some folks. But he's talking spiritual abundance. Uh, spiritual satisfaction in our lives. And to me, that verse summarizes the very heart of God and why He values all of human life. God is into creating life. He is into sustaining life. And He is into redeeming life. And we see, we see that through Jesus' death and resurrection. Everything that God has done in human history and everything He wants to do in the future of this world is about life. He sent His Son Jesus to save us from our sins and to give us a satisfying life here on earth and eternal life with Him. And, and boy, there's where the abundance is really going to be abundant there with Jesus in heaven. God has not given up His responsibility as Creator and Sustainer of life, but some human beings are making decisions about life that are opposed to God's will. Now, I don't know if anyone here has uh, had an abortion or encouraged someone to have an abortion. But if they are, I want them to know that God still values your life. And He wants you to experience His forgiveness and His grace. 1 John chapter 2, If anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Now notice, John, when he wrote this letter here, did not name a sin. It could be any sin. So whatever sin may be in our lives, God sent Christ to the cross as a sacrifice for everyone's sins. Now, not everyone has accepted Christ and His grace and His forgiveness. God's wrath, but God's wrath was satisfied by Jesus' death on the cross for the sins of everyone. Of course, we must acknowledge Jesus. We must acknowledge that we are sinners and that we need His forgiveness. We need to confess of our sins and we need to turn away from those sins and turn back to God. Again in 1 John chapter 1 this time, the writer said, we have, we have no, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we don't have any sin, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. And the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, Therefore, no condemnation exists for those in Christ Jesus. We, we must remember that Jesus 
is always about forgiveness. He is about restoration. Especially when we repent, when we turn away from our sin and turn back to Him. And when we sincerely repent, we can say and claim God's promise in Psalm 103, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Matter of fact, God forgets those sins. Doesn't hold them against us. We are forgiven. We serve a redeeming God. A God of cleansing. And a God of hope. Whatever the sin, even abortion, we don't have to suffer in silence. It may be for those those people who uh, have gone through an abortion that they need to tell their story to someone. They need uh, someone who will listen to them that loves them and cares for them and will help them walk with the Lord and experience His cleansing, His forgiveness. As a follower of Christ, Christ, as a follower of Christ, as long as there is breath, there is hope and there is help. As much as God values our lives, He values the lives of the unborn. Now, abortion, according to God's Word, is a moral issue. But there are people today who want us to believe that it's a social issue. It has nothing to do with, you know, with what, uh, what is moral. That's not true. It's a sin. It is wrong. Abortion is a moral issue. So, why are children being aborted? On your handout, you will see there, I'm going to uh, uh, read these. Uh, the, uh, the latest uh, information I could get was from Focus on the Family, and that was October of uh, 2022. But they, uh, the lady wrote this, the majority of women seeking an abortion say the decision comes from multiple themes, fears, or worries. Because of this, statistics can vary and most women will have more than one reason for abortion. The most common reasons for abortion include education or work, 76%, financial concern, 73%, fear of single motherhood, 48%, completed childbearing, don't want any more children, 40%, emotionally unprepared, 19%, Fetal health concern, 8%. Influence from family and friends, 5%. And rape or incest, 1%. Now, whether we want to admit it or not, abortion is a reflection on our view of life. We are increasingly devaluing life in the United States of America. And so we need to hear and read what the Bible has to say about this. God's Word is not silent about abortion. It speaks directly and it speaks clearly to this issue. Psalm 100, verse 3. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His. We are His people the sheep of His pasture. We are to value life. We are to love life. Because God is our Creator. And what He creates is a miracle. We are all miracles. The image of God is placed on every child at conception, not 
when the child is born. Genesis 1.27 God created man in His own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. That part's important, folks. God created male and female. And that implies that every baby conceived is valuable. That God has a purpose for every baby that is conceived. Now we won't find a specific verse in the Bible that tells us life begins at conception. But David, who was in, who was in awe, great awe of God and His power, wrote in Psalm 139, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I've been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know this full well, very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and plan before a single one of them began. God created us in the womb. We don't create ourselves. We're made in the image of God. We are His. We are made for His purpose. We are made for good works, which He planned for us to do before we were born. Ephesians 2.10 For we are His creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. Along with David, we should be praising God because we are remarkable beings. We are wonderful beings. Made by God and to be used by God. All of God's works are wonderful. Everything that God has has made is wonderful. Now, verse 16 in in that passage in Psalm 139. uh, Well, I've lost that. Where is it here? Verse 16 tells us that all our day all our days were written in God's book and planned before one of them began. That means that God is sovereign over all people and everything. He is the supreme being. He is the supreme ruler. Nothing happens that he does not know about. God has just as much love for a one-day-old fertilized egg, human egg, which really is a life, as he does for anyone, no matter what age they are. And we must not forget, Jesus died for that life that is in the womb. And he died for those outside the womb. Now the Bible does tell us about taking life before birth. Exodus 21 verses 22 through 25 tells us when men get in a fight and hit a pregnant woman so that her children are born prematurely but there is no injury, the one who hit her must be fined as the woman's husband demands from him, and he must pay according to judicial assessment. If there is an injury, then you must give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, bruise for bruise, wound for wound. Boy, it sounds rough there at the end, doesn't it? Huh? Well, 
I don't want us to misunderstand this, this part of, of Scripture. This was not a law allowing people to uh, gain vengeance against somebody that had hurt them or someone else. You'll notice in verse 22 it says the compensation for the injury is according to judicial assessment. It's not for an individual. And this formula called for proportionate punishment rather than a process of escalating violence between individuals or families. In Matthew 5, verses 40, 38 through 42, Jesus made clear that his followers were not to seek vengeance. So the point here, folks, is that God tells us we are not permitted to kill or harm or hurt the unborn. The Bible gives us God's perfect moral standards that apply to every culture, in every age. God's Word forbids us from shedding innocent blood. Proverbs 6.16 The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to Him. And one of those things is listed in verse 17. Hands that shed Innocent blood. And folks, you cannot find any more innocent blood than that of a baby in, in the womb. No matter what stage of life in the womb they are. They are very innocent. This morning I was looking through Kentucky Today, which is uh, something I get on the internet and through email every day. And it was telling a story about a, a young lady. Her name was Crystal, and Crystal's mother was raped. But she did not abort her baby. So Crystal is alive today. And Crystal is asked... People ask Crystal, well, you know, why her mother chose life for her even when people told her she had every right to abort her unborn child because of the circumstances of her conception. And Crystal's mother answers without hesitation, you were innocent. That's what she tells her daughter. You were innocent. You can't get any more innocent than being in the womb. Now Jesus, Jesus didn't mention uh, anything about abortion, but we do know that he loved children. He he he, he wanted children to come to him. We know that the disciples were trying to protect Jesus one one time, thinking he was wore out and didn't want children coming to him. But he he told them, "No, you let them come." Jesus loves children. And if we view babies as inconvenient to the point of killing them, then it violates Jesus' love for children. And since God values life differently than our culture does, we as Christians, we are called to value life just as Jesus does. Jesus valued life so much that He came to earth to give us a meaningful and satisfying life and eternal life. And I hope that everyone here this morning is enjoying that kind of life. And if you're not, then it may be that, that, that you just have not acknowledged who Jesus really is, that He is the Son of God. He is God. 
He is about life. And He is about forgiveness. He is about grace. So as we sing our invitation hymn this morning, if there's any decision that needs to be made for the Lord, we ask you to come. It may be a rededication of your life. It may be uh, uh, move your membership here. Whatever decision you might have. You might just need to come up and pray here at the, at the altar. It's, uh, we ask you uh, to come as we sing.